motoring news this week, we get so near to glory, yet so far. Wrap up another close championship. Ride along with the scariest thing in motor racing. And get all wet and sticky with the world's best biker. All this and more in this week's Drive. Over 8,000 of Michael Schumacher's fans were up before dawn to watch the Japanese Grand Prix on a big screen in the town square of Ferrari's home. There was no chance of any sleep before the race started at 7.30 a.m. local time, not with hundreds of foghorns being blasted regularly as the excitement grew. There was tension as Michael battled in the midfield and looked like he might lose it after all, but emotions poured out as the 34-year-old German scraped across the line in eighth place. Marinello erupting in a massive flag-waving celebration as Schumacher clinched an unprecedented sixth world title. Rubens won the race and the team collected a fifth constructors title in a row. All this despite changes to the rules this season to make races closer. Will the Marinello masses gather again a year hence? I wouldn't bet against it. Meanwhile, Michael's home fans in Germany were also up before dawn to watch the race on big screens. Wearing Ferrari red and waving giant Ferrari flags, the faithful were packed sardine-style into a sports hall in the Rhineland town where Michael Schumacher grew up. His father runs the Schumacher Kart Center and museum on the edge of town, where many hundreds of fans visited on Saturday. A roar of relief shook the whole town when Michael made history on the other side of the world. 30,000 visitors jammed into the former mining town, taking part in festivities and kart races on the streets. A parade of honking cars drove through the town shortly after the race. So, this is now the most successful Formula One driver in history. Let's take a look back at Michael Schumacher's career. Schumacher stands alone after surpassing the late Argentine Juan Manuel Fangio's five crowns achieved between 1951 and 57. This, the German Grand Prix of 57 at the fearsome Nürburgring, was undoubtedly Fangio's finest race. After a mid-race pit stop, he was 48 seconds down on the Ferraris of Englishmen Mike Hawthorne and Peter Collins, but Fangio broke the lap record on each of the last nine laps, eventually lowering it by a staggering 11 seconds. He claimed his fifth world championship with this victory, his last in a Grand Prix, and he retired a few months later at the age of 46. 35 years later, in 1992, Fangio was back behind the wheel of a racing Mercedes at the Norris Ring. He completed a few laps with a rising star of the Mercedes team, a young Michael Schumacher. In his seven years in Formula One, Fangio started in just 51 races, 29 from pole position, and he won 24 of them. Michael had demonstrated his form years earlier, here winning at the South African Kart Grand Prix at Swartkorps in 1987. He started karting at the age of four in a machine built by Father Rolf and powered by a lawnmower engine. Schumacher's first Formula One win came at Spa in a Benetton in 1992, exactly a year after his debut with Jordan. His first title in 1994 was celebrated with his teammate, Eddie Irvine. Schumacher and Damon Hill collided in the deciding race in Australia, Schumacher claiming the crown when the Briton was pushed off the track. Hill's duels with Schumacher breathed controversy into the championship and the incident gained him a reputation as a tough competitor. Joining Michael celebrating his title was fiance Karina. A year later, the couple were married and Michael claimed a then record nine wins to take his second title. The hard man proved he also had a wild side as he celebrated a win in front of the Brandenburg Gate in the recently reunited Berlin. With back-to-back -back titles with Benetton, Schumacher jumped to the underperforming Ferrari. Hill took his revenge and the title in 1996 as Michael began to mold a new team around him from the mid-rankers that Ferrari had become. He joined Irvine in the team, headed by Jean Tot and overseen by Fiat Supremo Gianni Agnelli. I was not looking for uh, an easy job where I sit in a car and I'm going to be able to win every race or where people at least expect me to win every race. That is not the kind of challenge I'm looking for. I really want to fight hard for the victories as I have done always in past. In 1997, Schumacher was stripped of second place in the championship after trying to run Jacques Villeneuve off the road in the title decider, providing more controversy as the driver's title stayed with Williams. 
1998, the title went to McLaren and Mika Hakkinen, and the following season, Schumacher's title hopes were dashed when he broke his leg in a crash at the British Grand Prix at Silverstone. But in 2000, Schumacher claimed the first of four consecutive titles and the first for Ferrari in 21 years. He has won more titles, races, podiums, points and fastest laps than any other driver and only Ayrton Senna had more pole positions. And he's unconcerned about claims that he had a superior car. I have had fighting for many, many years in Formula One with maybe not always the best car and I'm quite happy to have a certain time in my career where I can uh, enjoy the, the moments as we do. Other teams, other drivers had the, the luxury before and now I have it. The world turns around and uh, those things turn around as well. So let's see what the future brings. For the past four years, Formula One has been a tale of Schumacher and Ferrari's success and the German has said that he wants to keep on winning for some time yet. In the closest season in years, Raikkonen needed to win the last round with Michael not scoring to take the title. Kimi was second and Schumacher added a single point. After strong early and mid-season showings respectively, both McLaren and Williams faded and both Ferraris kept scoring points. Only one man, Finland's Kimi Raikkonen, could have prevented Michael Schumacher from winning a record sixth Formula One title at the season-ending Japanese Grand Prix. Going into the race, Raikkonen trailed Schumacher in the standings by nine points, and he acknowledged that his chances of snatching the championship from the German were slim. His strong showing came in spite of McLaren's new car never actually making it onto the grid. Part of Raikkonen's preparation for races is relaxation. The Finn returns to his home in the Swiss Alps to recharge his batteries, spending much of his time on two wheels instead of four. I started with the motocross when I was young, before go-karting, and I still do it when I have uh, free time, and it's really good fun, it's good training for fitness-wise, and uh, it's something what I like to do on my free time. But the 23-year-old Finn can look back on a season which has exceeded his expectations. And, as four times champion Alain Prost once said, I'm younger, I have more time. Of course it's disappointing, but uh, I think so we were not expecting before the season that we, we are in such a strong position where we are now. But um, then we try it next year again. Now the season's over, Kimi has plenty of time to indulge in one of his other favourite sports, ice hockey. Just before the final race, BAR boss David Richards announced that ex-world champion Jacques Villeneuve would be replaced in the team next year. True to form, Jacques promptly walked out before the final round. Today, I'm very pleased to announce that lining up against, uh, against Jensen next, next year in the BAR team, your own Japanese driver, Takuma Sato. The 26-year-old Sato raced for Jordan last season, but moved back to BAR as a test driver this year. His best race finish was fifth at last year's Japanese Grand Prix at Suzuka. Now, of course, it would be uh, very remiss of me if I wasn't to mention uh, Jacques Villeneuve. He, over the last few years, has shown enormous commitment and loyalty to the team through uh, a period of time, the early development of the team, which has been very difficult for him. And um, he's one of these characters, as you all know, who uh, never fails to speak his mind. Uh, but having said that, there comes a time in, in all relationships when uh, you have to move on. And that really is the simple explanation of my decision concerning Jack. I personally hope that Formula One hasn't seen the last of him because I think he's an incredible character and a great asset to the sport. Villeneuve won the 97 world title with Williams. So that was a really like last year. It's always straight into the race, only racing experience. Now I think this year I could learn so many things outside of the racing which is basically a development program and back to back test for the testing. So I really learned so many things how the F1 car is developing to the future. And uh, I really could say, you know, we never know until um, I'm doing racing because I never raced since Suzuka time. But uh, I'm really confident to go to the straight away because I've done so much mileage with the team and technically a more understanding for the car and I know how exactly the tyre or the suspension, the aero and the engine works for the Formula One. It's all together, all come together. So I think it's much better, I would say, but you never know. But I will be very aggressive next year again. 
Sato signed a three-year deal with BAR and Richards believes signing the driver will further solidify the relationship between BAR and engine supplier Honda. Villeneuve's only point scoring results this year were sixth place finishes in Italy and Brazil. In his first race for the team, Sato matched him, taking sixth in Japan. The only Japanese driver currently in Formula One, Sato will be looking to score more points at more tracks in 2004. Over 100,000 spectators packed into Hockenheim for the 10th and final race of the 2003 DTM German touring car season. They came to see a title showdown between three times DTM champion Bernd Schneider and his young Dutch teammate Christian Albers. Schneider started with a one point lead over Albers, and whoever crossed the line first would take the title. Schneider got off to a good start from fifth on the grid and was just in front of seventh placed Albers. Schneider soon moved up to fourth when he overtook Germany's Martin Tomsik who lost ground further when he spun on lap four of 37. Out in front, Jean Alessi passed the Audi of Sweden's Matthias Ekström to grab the lead on lap eight. Schneider was forced to draw on all of his experience in an early battle for third place with Great Britain's Peter Dumbreck in the red Opel. Dumbreck got the better of the opening exchanges and Schneider's other Mercedes teammate, Marcel Fassler of Switzerland, then overtook him on lap 12 to push the German back to fifth. Albers was not far behind, but the Dutchman lost valuable time when he ran wide entering the stadium section on lap 16. But Schneider soon found himself in trouble when he punctured a tyre less than half a lap later. Luckily, the 39-year-old was just a few metres from the pit lane entry at the time. Meanwhile, Fassler got past Umbreck on lap 23 to move into third place, but all the attention was focused on the battle for sixth. Albers closed right up on Schneider and was right behind his championship rival throughout lap 25. But disaster struck for Albers on the next lap when he punctured his left rear tyre, just as Schneider had. But Albers had to crawl along for half a lap to reach the pits. He fell back to 17th, effectively bringing the title to a disappointing end. Ekstrom pushed Alessi all the way to the finish, but couldn't prevent the Frenchman from taking the chequered flag by just 0.213 of a second. Fassler was third. Schneider's sixth place finish saw him win the title with 68 points, four points clear of Albers, and Fassler was third again with 57 points. I had a fantastic season. I enjoyed so much with uh, my team, the car, the fans. It's, uh, DTM is uh, just uh, a magic uh, competition. I'm very happy. Um, I reached everything I wished uh, this year. It was very close in the end, and I'm, uh, this time uh, the race our race god was with me. Schneider's other DTM championship victories came in 1995, 2000 and 2001. Before a crowd of 80,000 fans, the Banquet 400, race 30 of 36 this season, got underway at the Kansas Speedway, with Jimmy Johnson claiming pole position at just over 180 miles an hour. On lap 69, Michael Waltrip hit the outside wall. Points leader Matt Kenseth tried to avoid Waltrip, but spun and crashed hard into the inside wall. That caused extensive damage to the front end of his car. And Kenseth was able to get the car restarted, but as he pulled away, a broken oil line started a fire. He took his car to the pits, not returning until lap 113. He would finish in 36th place. Elliot Sadler also had a fiery experience. His right front tire blew, and he hit the outside wall hard, which started a fire in his oil pump. And you see, well, there's the fuel pump fire. Eh, eh. On the Ford, the fuel pump is on the left side. Yep, that's the oil pump fire. That's oil that... BP Jeff Green was luckier when his right front tire blew. Bits of it flapped around like a rag doll as he made his way down pit road. But at least there were no flames to contend with. Kurt Busch, though, experienced a much more serious fire than either Sadler or Green. On lap 182, Bush slowed at the bottom of the track with flames visible from underneath his car. Within seconds, there was fire in the cabin too, any racing driver's worst fear. Bush parked, removed the steering wheel and bailed out in record time. All that oil that we saw inside the car got so hot that it caught on fire. 
Ryan Newman elected not to take part in a flurry of pit stops with 65 laps to go and then held off a furious challenge from Bill Elliott to win his series-leading eighth victory of the year. It was his ninth win from just 74 NASCAR races. Jeremy Mayfield, who stayed out of the pits along with Newman, was third as Dodgers took all three top spots. Elliott, third after a restart with 14 laps to go on the 1.5-mile trioval, got held up by Mike Skinner's lapped car. He passed Mayfield with 11 laps to go, but couldn't mount a serious challenge on Newman. It's running fine. The 14th MotoGP race was at Sepang, and it was expected that the title would be decided there. Organizers invited two Chinese riders to race in the Grand Prix, a first. Huang Shi Zhao and He Zi Zhang made their world championship debuts in the 250cc class, riding for the Spanish Dantin Yamaha team. Another wildcard entry was Suzuki's Akira Rio in his second race in MotoGP after a creditable 10th place at Motegi. However, championship leader Valentino Rossi's contractual negotiations with Honda grabbed more attention at a press conference. No, we don't have any news now because my manager arrived uh, this night with the uh, with the contract for uh, for Honda and after uh, we decide so any news for, from uh, last week the situation is always the same and uh, but now we need to <laughs> to think also of the race at the championship Rossi's great rival Max Biaggi won here last year and claimed victory at the previous round in Japan Biaggi was on the pace in a pre-event kart race joined by rivals Troy Bayless in 12, Colin Edwards in 45 and Nicky Hayden in 69. He won't be able to catch Rossi this year, but Biaggi is only 25 points behind second-placed Sete Gibinau of Spain. Bayless and Hayden get away, but Norik Abe is stuck on the grid. Also in the kart race were 250cc riders Sebastian Porto and Chaz Davies and 125cc racer Steve Yankner. Yaji came home to win in some style ahead of Porto and Bayless and promptly swapped four wheels for two, aiming to start the process of being first across the line on race day. Max would be happy to stand on top of a MotoGP podium, and so would Porto and Bayless. But after setting a new pole record in the first qualifying session, Rossi was in even better form during the final qualifying session. The indomitable Italian set a new qualifying record not once but twice, flying around the five and a half kilometer Sepang circuit at the end of the session to ensure his seventh pole of the season. The only rider who came close to threatening Rossi's dominance was Carlos Checa. The Spaniard recovered after embarrassingly crashing into his Fortuna Yamaha teammate Marco Melandri earlier in the session. After dusting himself off, Checker improved his provisional time by around two seconds, charging up the timesheet to second place on the grid. Checker pushed Makato Tomada down to third spot, the Japanese rider starting from the front row for the second consecutive race. Biaggi took victory here last year, but would have to pick up the pace to repeat the feat. He claimed fourth on the grid, six tenths off Rossi's time. Shinya Nakano continued his qualifying form, taking his seventh second row start of the season in fifth place. Loris Caparossi dropped to sixth, and Sete Gibinau could only manage seventh fastest, leaving Rossi satisfied. Two or three times pushed the front, but uh, at the end, 2.0, so it's fantastic, I'm very happy. And also, we work for the race. Uh, we are in pole position, so the better, the better, the better position. Uh, we need to make our tire choice, and uh, we wait for tomorrow. In the 250cc class, Spain's Tony Elias set a new pole record on his last lap, claiming his fourth pole position in a row. The Aprilia rider's time was nine tenths quicker than his nearest challenger and championship leader Manuel Poggiali of San Marino, who would start on the front row for the 11th time this year. Fresh from his maiden victory two weeks before, Jorge Lorenzo claimed a maiden pole in the 125s from fellow Spaniard Dani Pedrosa. 18-year-old Pedrosa stood to win the championship if he took the checkered flag, depending on where rival Stefano Perugini finished. Rossi didn't need to beat Gibinau to win the title. 
All he needed was second place, or worse if Jubinau performed badly, to secure an overall points lead of 50 or more that would be unbeatable with only two races left this season. But nothing about his form suggested that Rossi would play it safe in Malaysia's 30 degree plus tropical heat, and he didn't. Starting from the second row, Jubinau led the pack into the first turn and stayed in front for six laps. Rossi pushed Jubinau before making his move on the seventh lap, coming up inside the Spaniard as they slowed for a tight left-hand corner, which gave the Italian a shorter inside track and allowed him to power out in the lead. Rossi built a two-second lead and held it for the rest of the race. The win put Rossi 63 points clear of Jubinau in the points and gave him his 20th consecutive podium, drawing close to Giacomo Agostini's record of 22 top three finishes between 1967 and 69. After the checkered flag, Rossi stopped in front of his pit team, jumped off the bike and gave them a double-fisted salute before leaping over the protective wall into their arms. Max looks just a little vindictive as he tries to drown his rival, and champagne in the eyes really stings too. For sure, I'm uh, very, very happy for the race and also for the championship. It was uh, a great championship, uh, had a very hard fight with everybody. It's possible to win uh, some races, some good races, some races very enjoyed. And uh, we work at the top for all the year. We are uh, quite constant and so it's possible at the end of uh, the first position. Rossi claims his third Premier Class title in a row and the fifth World Championship of his career, and he's only 24. Some minor places can change before the end of the year. Dani Pedrosa grabbed the lead going into the first corner and broke away from the pack by the end of the first lap with a three-second advantage. He scored his first podium since the Czech Republic, winning his fifth race of the year and becoming the second youngest world champion the sport has ever seen. The Spaniard knew he had only to keep the machine upright once he learned that his title rival, Stefano Perugini, had been forced to retire after three laps. Casey Stoner set two fastest laps but crashed from third with six laps to go when he clipped the rider in front. Mika Carlio beats Jorge Lorenzo to second place on his KTM. Pedrosa's rise has been a fairy tale. Answering an advert, he competed in the Activa Cup in 99 and was selected from hundreds of hopefuls for the 125cc Spanish Championship in 2000. Four pole positions and fourth overall got him into the World Championship in 2001. Aged just 15, Pedrosa took two podiums and came eighth in his debut season. Last year, he took his first victory at Assen, nine podiums and six poles, finishing third in the title. And now the fairy tale is a reality. Dani Pedrosa is the 125cc world champion. The champ may be crowned, but the minor placings are too close to call, and second to sixth places could easily be rearranged after the next two rounds. In the 250s, pole sitter Elias dropped behind points leader Manuel Poggiali for three laps before catching him and passing him to build a nine-second lead. Poggiali held off Fonzi Nieto by one one-hundredth of a second as Nieto tried to back up his teammate Elias in his tilt at the title. Elias is the second most successful 250cc Spanish rider ever behind Cito Pons, with six career victories, five of them this season. He currently ties on points with Rolfo and both trail Poggiali by 25 in the standings, with 50 still up for grabs. In closing, we salute three worthy champions. And so you stay on track and up to speed. Make sure you catch next week's Drive.